So in the last video, we talked about time dilation and length contraction, kind of like separate phenomena that occur when two observers are moving with respect to each other at a fixed velocity. However, in this video, we're going to see that they're both just manifestations of the way in which the space and time coordinates of events are shifted in different, ref uh, different reference frames. So imagine that we have some coordinate system k. Now imagine that we have a second coordinate system k prime that is moving at a constant velocity with respect to k. Now let's say that we have some event in k, which is just characterized by a set of space and time coordinates. Now the present question is, how do we transform these coordinates so that we can actually capture how the event is seen in the k prime reference frame, given that it moves at some given velocity? Well, it turns out that a scheme was worked out by a physicist named Hendrik Lorentz, who actually derived the relevant mathematics before the advent of special relativity. Uh, in fact, ironically, he and some others um, worked out quite a bit of the mathematics of special relativity uh, in an attempt actually to save uh, the ether theory, so without the coherent theoretical basis that Einstein later gave. Uh, but in any case, the so-called Lorentz transformation equations uh, turned out to be applicable uh, to special relativity, and in this video um, I'll give a derivation of them. But I'll give a derivation that Einstein later presented, which depends only on his two postulates. So to derive these transformations, imagine that at the point where the origins of the systems coincide, a spherical wavefront of light is produced. Now this light uh, radiates outward symmetrically, and crucially, it does this regardless of which reference frame you choose. So from the perspective of k prime, uh, the wave front also radiates out in a completely spherical manner. So the result is that for both reference frames, points on the spherical wave front are going to satisfy the relation x squared plus y squared plus z squared uh, equals to ct squared. Uh, so whatever the Lorentz transformations are, they're going to have to satisfy these simultaneous conditions. And of course, this is the case for where the space and time origins of the two reference frames coincide. So it turns out, just given these conditions, we can work out what the transformation is. And in this video, I'll stick to the example where k prime is purely moving in the x direction. And in the next video, I'll generalize this to the case where k prime can move in any direction. So first off, we know that the y and z coordinates just stay the same, since the motion of k prime is purely in the x direction. So in the y and z axes, the two coordinate systems are identical. So restricting ourselves to the x axis, we can imagine two beams of light that just radiate from the origin. For the forward beam, it's the case that x equals to ct, and of course this holds for the k prime system as well. So we can now arrive at these equations. Now it must be the case that when we transform coordinates that satisfy uh, x minus ct equals 0 uh, into the k prime frame, then it must also be the case that x prime minus ct prime also equals to 0 since they're just describing the same beam of light in different reference frames. So Einstein proposed that there has to be a linear relationship between the two expressions with a scaling factor lambda, sim simply on the basis that when one is equal to zero, the other has to be equal to zero. Now he doesn't really explain in detail why a linear relationship is chosen instead of, say, a quadratic relationship, where it's also true that if one is zero, then the other is, is zero, uh, but I think there are several reasons why only a linear transformation makes sense in the context of relativity. First of all, the principle of relativity states that when we look at the k prime frame from the perspective of k, then it should look exactly the same as if we were looking at the k system from the perspective of k prime, just in the other uh, direction perhaps. So the two are in some sense interchangeable. And the neatness about the linearity assumption is that if the transformation from k to k prime were linear, then the reverse transformation would also be linear, so the form is conserved. 
However, if, say, there was a square mapping from k to k prime, then the reverse mapping would necessarily have to be some kind of square root mapping. And this violates the principle of relativity, because now the mapping from k to k prime does not have the same form as the mapping from k prime to k. Uh, but, you know, how could this be the case if there were no uh, privileged reference frame? You know, how would we decide in which direction the square mapping goes and in which direction the square root mapping goes, for instance? Now, another way of looking at this is to imagine that now we have three reference frames, k, k prime, and k double prime, where the relative velocity of k double prime to k prime is the same as the relative velocity of k prime to k. Now, according to the principle of relativity, k double prime is to k prime what k prime is to k. Or putting it in a different way, the transformation from k to k prime must be identical to the transformation from k prime to k double prime. So if we're trying to transform the x coordinate of some event, then it must be the case that x prime over x is equal to x double prime over x prime. Now let's just assume that uh, x prime equals to x squared. If this were the case, then x double prime would be equal to x to the power of 4. And clearly, it is not generally true that x squared divided by x is equal to x to the power of 4 divided by x squared. The left-hand side is equal to x, and the right-hand side is equal to x squared. Moreover, what this scheme would imply is that the transformation from x to x prime depends on the specific value of x instead of just the vo relative velocity. And if there are no privileged reference frames, then in which coordinate system should we get this specific value of x? So clearly the assumption of linearity uh, avoids a whole lot of contradictions that we would otherwise uh, encounter. Now, I'd just like to mention quickly that some have suggested that the linearity assumption is necessary to satisfy the condition that there must be a one-to-one -one mapping between events in k and events in k prime. So, for instance, if there was a square relationship, then this wouldn't be the case, since both plus 3 and minus 3 would map to plus 9 and so on. However, this would not exclude other one-to-one -one functions, such as the exponential function, uh, so I don't think this argument quite works. So overall, um, these are some of the reasons why I think the linearity assumption makes sense. So this is what the proportionality equation looks like for the forward beam, and of course it also applies to the backward beam, according to another scaling factor mu, and here the only difference is that x increases as t, uh, sorry, x decreases as t increases. So from here, it's just a bit of algebra. If we subtract uh, the uh, bottom uh, term from the top term, then we get these expressions. And of course, we can just cancel out the x prime terms. So here we get this expression for ct prime, uh, where we're grouping the x and t terms. And finally, we can get this expression by inventing some new variables a and b uh, to simplify things. So now that we have that, let's see what happens when we add these two terms. So here the result is similar, except now we can just cancel out the ct prime terms to get our expression for x, which we can also express in terms of a and b like so. So now we have these two expressions for x prime and ct prime. Now we can observe that at the spatial origin of k prime, uh, which we can call o prime, uh, x prime equals to zero, which means that ax equals bct, and this means that x equals bct uh, over a. And now we also know that x equals vt. Um, this is just the, uh, in, in other words, uh, the origin of k prime uh, moves relative to k uh, according to this equation. So the origin of k prime uh, so the x coordinate of the origin of k prime is going to be equal to the velocity times t, uh, where t is seen from the k uh, frame. 
So now if we put these two uh, equations together, we can arrive at an expression of the velocity v in terms of b a and the speed of light c. So let's uh, park that result for now. Uh, now I think the most subtle part of the proof comes when Einstein asks us to imagine what it's like to look at one reference frame from the perspective of the other reference frame. And of course this is going to look the same in both directions. So imagine that we're in the k frame and we freeze the clock at zero, so t equals zero, and we're sitting in the k system. So what this means is that uh, x prime equals to ax. Now this means that if we have a meter ruler that is stationary uh, in the k frame, uh, sorry, the k prime frame, then in the k frame it'll look like it has a length of one uh, divided by a meters, and this is just due to the equation x prime equals ax. And here, I know what you're thinking, uh, this looks uh, a lot like length contraction, um, and uh, it really is. But in any case, moving on, now let's look at things from the k prime frame. If we freeze the clock at t prime equals zero, then we know that act equals bx. So now the question is, if we have a meter ruler that is stationary in the k frame, then what would its length be in the k prime frame? Well, now we can use our equation, ACT minus BX, um, and then now divide both sides by A and multiply by B, and then use our velocity equation to just get uh, this, um, and uh, which we can then uh, express like so. And now we recognize that BCT is just uh, the second term of the right-hand side of our X prime equation, so now we can arrive at a new expression for x prime in terms of x. So now we have something interesting. From the perspective of k, a meter rule that is stationary in k prime is now contracted to length 1 minus, uh, sorry, 1 divided by a. Similarly, from the perspective of k prime, a meter rule that is now stationary in k is now contracted to a length uh, a times 1 minus v squared over c squared. And the principle of relativity tells us that these two transformations must be exactly the same. So we know that 1 divided by a is equal to a times 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now we can now divide both sides by a uh, and take the reciprocal to get this. Then we can see that a is just equal to one of the two square roots of this expression. Now we know that the expression inside the square root is positive, and we also want to make it such that the x prime and x axes face in the same direction, so we'll just choose the positive root, which is of course just equivalent to our boost factor gamma. So now we have an expression for a, and given our expression of b in terms of a, we can now find a workable expression for b as well. So now all we have to do is substitute these uh, into our expression for x prime and also t prime to arrive at our transformation equations. So there we have it. Here's our full set of Lorentz transformation equations for the specific case of k prime moving along the x axis. Now, as I promised at the start of the video, we'll take a look at how we can derive the phenomena of time dilation and length contraction just from these transformations. So for time dilation, we assume that we have two events that occur at the same spatial position in k, though at different times. And of course, uh, it'll look slightly differently in the k prime frame. But in any case, the question we want to ask is, given our time interval in k and using uh, our Lorentz transformation, um, can we work out our, uh, the equivalent time interval in k prime? And it turns out, we can do so, where here uh, we're cancelling out the v terms, uh, sorry, the x terms in the equation, because the x value doesn't change, the position doesn't change, and of course we arrive at our classic time dilation equation. So what about length contraction? Well, I guess we already got a glimpse during the derivation stage about how it might work, but let's see how we can use the transformation equations now that we've got them. But first,
we should be clear that by length we just mean the spatial distance between two events that are simultaneous. In other words, that have the same time value. And this is a bit of a subtlety because as we saw in the previous video, simultaneity is relative. So if, say, we have a stick that is stationary in K, we can measure its length by firing off two beams of light and then taking x2 minus x1. That would be equal to the length of the stick. However, this is only valid because t1 is also equivalent to t2. If we repeat this procedure uh, in the k1 frame, sorry, in the k prime frame, we would not be able to use uh, x1 prime and x2 prime because t1 prime would not be equivalent to t2 prime. So in other words, the length of the stick is the spatial distance between events at either end of the stick that also have the same time coordinate. And of course, this also goes in the other direction. So if we properly measure the length of the stick in k prime, then uh, the corresponding time coordinates in k will not be uh, equal to each other. Now with that out of the way, let's take our equation for x prime. And we can see that due to the principle of relativity, the equation for x in terms of the uh, k prime coordinates is the same, except now the velocity is reversed. Uh, and now we can use this equation, or these two equations, to get an expression for the ratio between the two x intervals, where we can just cancel out uh, the t1 uh, prime and t2 prime terms because these are equal, and now we are left with our familiar length contraction equation. So now we can see how time dilation and length contraction just kind of tumble out naturally from the Lorentz transformations, which we can derive in turn just using Einstein's two postulates. Now what becomes apparent from these transformations is that they alter the coordinates of space and time in a way that appears interlinked such that the mathematician Hermann Minkowski would later propose the idea of an interconnected space-time coordinate system. And we'll cover that in another video. But in the next video, we'll take a look at how we can generalize the Lorentz transformations to the case of an arbitrary three-dimensional velocity vector.